Next up, I have very excited to welcome a powerhouse panel here in place. Um, I don't, yes, thank you. <laughs> we have uh, Victor uh, actually going to be moderating a session, like I said, very powerhouse list of folks that we have on board here to actually talk a little bit about data granularity. What do you do once it's actually unleashed? They're going to share some real life use cases of what they're doing with that um, within the company. So with that said, I want to introduce uh, Eyal from Yelp, Andy from Kabam, Patrick from Postmates, Warren from Nexon, and Eric Soufer from Network. Please give them a warm round of applause. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, really, really excited to have you guys share your thoughts, experiences, thank you, uh, with, with the greater audience. Uh, before we get into things, we'd love to guys, uh, for you guys to just provide brief introductions of kind of your role, your capacity today, and um, yeah, I guess we'll start with Eric on the left. Yep. Hi, my name is Eric. I'm, um, I run uh, Platform, uh, which is our internal um, advertising platform and publishing platform at Network. Uh, we're a mobile gaming company. We make the game, Legendary Game of Heroes. Cool. Warren Woodward, uh, Executive Director of User Acquisition at Nexon. We're an international uh, gaming publisher and developer. Fun fact about Nexon, we own a franchise that nobody knows about in the US that makes more money a year than the Star Wars IP called uh, Dungeon and Fighter, but basically no one knows it in the US. <laughs> nice we do fun. now, we do now. I'm Patrick, <laughs> Director of User Acquisition at Postmates. We're an on-demand delivery platform, and I run all new customer acquisition and fleet acquisition. My name is Andy Park. I'm the Director of User Acquisition at Kabam. We are developer of AAA uh, high-fidelity games. Our most popular title right now is Marvel Contest of Champions, which has over 140 million downloads and localized in 17 different languages. Hi, my name is Eyal. I'm uh, running the online marketing team on the consumer side at Yelp, driving app installs and re-engagement to the core Yelp app. Yelp uh, is a well-known brand in the US. We have about 30 million MAUs on mobile. Awesome, awesome. Um, so just following up to my previous presentation uh, and actually that one diagram that looked at the different levers of optimization, uh, we wanted to kind of just firstly kind of drill into your process today and how that works and you know, just kind of uh, compare and contrast across teams and uh, your guys' kind of fundamental beliefs on how to approach it. So uh, the base kind of bread and butter uh, approach around publisher level uh, seems to be something that you know we had discussed, uh, you know, before this presentation of how does that work today? And if you were, let's say, starting out a UA program, how would you approach it? And, and I guess, I guess, lead off with, with you, Patrick. Like, what's the the process around publisher level optimization that you you undergo? So. There's kind of a problem with us of um, optimization at the publisher level. It's kind of at the limitation of the ad network, so you kind of have to discuss with each individual ad network, um, you know, what their level of reporting is. Uh, Singular has some integrations with the advertising at the sub-publisher level. Um, our, our optimization process starts at the cost per new unique purchaser on the customer side, um, and then we monitored day seven return on ad spend, day 30, um, and forecasted uh, break-even point um, in LTV. Um, the process also for us is a little bit more difficult since we operate more at a city level uh, targeting. So we treat our acquisition strategy different in New York City than it might be in LA. Um, so breaking up your campaigns can sometimes be a little bit more difficult. Some advertising uh, partners won't be able to drive, or some advertising networks and publishers won't be able to drive installs or volume at uh, such a hyper-targeted uh, location. Uh, then at that point in time, you kind of tear it out. So it honestly depends on each individual ad network and, and publisher. Got it. Um, what about yourself, Eric? Is like, is this? I know it's pretty. I would say standard in, in general. But I mean, is there a specific path that you advise the team to take that you're very familiar with? You start at the campaign level, do you drill further, or do you get straight to the chase and you know look at the publishers? Yeah, uh, I think on. So you could split this out. Um, across the different types of channels. So on you know, the owned and operated, there's nothing to do there at the publisher level. But then at the um, rewarded video level, it's just basically like a you know, two or three times a week process of uh, pruning out the uh, low performers. I mean, the, the problem there, uh, as Patrick mentioned, is that you know, there's, just, there's no standardized way of reporting uh, you know, publishers by the networks. And so 
you might get like a proprietary ID or some might tell you actually which publisher it is. Mm -hmm. um, but then we also do a lot of advertising on programmatic and there it's much easier and, and much more transparent. Um, so, you know, we target, we have like a, a huge list that we've built of uh, performant um, bundle IDs for different apps. And so we target those and then we kill them. Um, you know, at the line item level, if they're not performing, so there it's it's a lot more straightforward um, than at, with the ad networks, where especially if it's not self serve, you have to kind of yeah. send your AM some list of uh, hashes of or... yeah of publishers to kill. And the, I mean, the thing is, it's also cyclical. I mean, there, there's no necessary, there's not necessarily like a rhyme or reason to it. It's just this week they're not. I mean, you know, whatever. One of the Voodoo games got a huge surge of uh, installs. Uh, and they're driving, you know, they're sending you a bunch yeah. of crappy traffic, but next week they might be form performing really well. So it's hard, I think, even at the network level to just say definitively, okay, this publisher sucks, stop running there, and then you have to revisit that, you know, and... Uh, the ones that you did blacklist already and say, yeah. okay, let me... But it's got to be of your own volition, right? Because exactly. you have to have, you, you've got to be motivated by whatever to tell them to, to you know, reinitiate yep. campaigns. So um, to the point of hashes and names of the pu publisher sites, um, I, I guess, in execution, it, it likely doesn't really matter, right? You're going to essentially kill the publishers either way and say, we're not going to run those. But I guess, what would the added benefit of, of having publisher names on a consistent basis allow you guys to, to do? And that's more so to the, the forum. Yeah, I mean, uh, since we're buying on multiple networks and supply sources, uh, it helps uh, basically strategize and understand uh, where not to overbid or bid against yourselves, right? Yep. So as an example, if you're buying on uh, two different DSPs and they're both buying on Mopub, they will bid up against each other potentially on a particular placement if it has enough uh, volume and is relevant enough. Uh, what we've been pushing uh, partners like Facebook and Google on is, you know, they have their own uh, networks, but they're being uh, not super transparent on sharing those, whereas uh, Mopubs of the world is, and the DSPs are kind of uh, sharing as much uh, insights as they can. So uh, I think a level playing field across all supply sources would help uh, the buyer understand where they're buying and also uh, yeah, not compete uh, with themselves on the same exact traffic. I was just going to add, I, I disagree. I think that, that having a clear publisher name matters a lot. You yeah. want to aggregate that info and like, I don't need to learn from my games that my Talking Tom doesn't perform like with a hashed ID on eight different networks, like just get enough collective uh, data and use that to make the decision or, you know, to, as soon as you see traffic, say, oh, I already know that app. I've already got data on it. We don't need more data here. Got it. So I guess um, in, in terms of working with your different channel partners, um, what is the base expectation around this? I mean, has this ever been a, like a, a deal breaker in terms of being able to even have access to this level of granularity? Um, what cases is it a deal breaker? When is it a deal breaker? And has that changed uh, in, in your guys' time just in, in this industry? Well, one example is uh, an unnamed DSP doesn't want to share uh, impression level data. Let's ignore pub names. Like they'll share pub names and not impression level data. That's a level of granularity that is uh, table stakes. Like if you don't get impression level data, then you're uh, basically putting yourself at risk as a buyer with uh, different fraud tactics and other things. So I think by now every network we work with individually, like we've gotten them to give us pub names and give us impression level data. And uh, I think that's kind of the, the golden standard right now, or it can be, it depends on how you choose your partners. Yeah, and at even more basic level than that, one thing that we always look for in any, um, outside of like the first tier of networks that you kind of show in the, well, the, 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 top, the head of the marketing and mm -hmm. um, that mid that mid level. Uh, when you start getting into that long tail of the, the affiliate world and some things that um, advertise themselves as programmatic, but who knows what, what it actually is, uh, just besides passing the pub ID at a more basic level, just what is your traffic? Can you show me this ad in the wild? Um, and it's amazing how many uh, sources actually break down when you push them to like, do you, do you even understand yeah. what your traffic is? Can you show me it? Um, always very disappointing. Yep. But it's an early, early red flag. <laughs> uh, I totally agree with all these guys are saying. Just one thing that I want to add from kind of our standpoint is, for us, uh, a lot is, has to do with contextual targeting, how our game fits with those video advertisements that we're on. So at the end of the day, it's for my team and I to learn, 
hey, you know, more of this mid-core genre works with our game Kabam as opposed to this super hyper-casual runner game. And so that helps us to avoid these publishers when we go out to find new traffic elsewhere. And I think that knowledge is helpful just in advance so you don't step on any landmines uh, when you start your marketing campaign. Got it. Now, a lot of this is revolving around you know, your interactions with your network partners. And I guess from an operational perspective, how does this data granularity tie in, whether it's having conversations on fraud or reconciling invoices and things of that sort? And again, this is more about just making sure you can share perspective on you know, the good times and the bad and, and what you kind of, again, expect in these types of conversations. All right. So, yeah. yeah, we'll start with the F word then, fraud. Yeah. Um, so I think there's two ways to look at this. One is prevention and protection. You as the advertiser, that I.O. is very important to you. Many times I've seen that I.O. just get shot out with no specifications or clarifications. Mm -hmm. That happens. That's your, that's your bad. But if you specifically say, hey, I want to avoid Outfit 7 apps. I want to avoid endless runners. These are my KPIs. These are the events that I'm going to send you. I think it becomes a very constructive and a transparent discussion that you have with your ad partners when it pertains to fraud. Obviously, there's other parts of it, like really malicious fraud, when we're talking click injection, click mm -hmm. stuffing, organic sniping. I think that the onus on that may go up to the attribution partner because you know it's a little bit harder for us to see that. But when we are doing performance marketing campaigns, our advertising partners should be held to the same performance KPIs that we lay out in the I.O. And I think that's really important just to set, set it straight. Andy touched on a good point there, which is just like setting the rules of engagement with yep. the network clearly up front. Um, most of the attribution platforms have decent fraud suites that are going to catch a lot of this stuff now, but there's things like incent that are harder to detect. Um, so set the rules of like early funnel metrics beyond ROAS of just like, hey, if we see that you know th this this game usually has a 90% tutorial completion, if we see a source that has over X amount of installs and uh, deviates from that norm by you know over 50%, we're going to consider that incent or some other type of fraud. Um, so if you set those terms with the network, even build it into the I.O. if needed, there should be no dispute later on, and you should be able to get your make goods quickly where needed. Also on that, like uh, you can, what we, we've done is partner with a third party, uh, 24, uh, 24 Metrics, um, and basically we say what they say goes. Uh, their, okay. fraud, their fraud tool is very robust. I very much like it. So um, in terms of um, the granularity in which it gives you is something that I haven't seen um, as much, but uh, for other competitors. Uh, so basically what we've integrated in every IO is to say, if they say this is click injection or in send traffic, then it is. Would, uh, why do you have such a bone to pick with Outfit 7? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying. <laughs> Talking Tom Gold Rush is a fantastic game. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I feel like if you're having these conversations, you've lost the plot a little bit. I don't. I, don't, I, I never saw any uh, reason to dig into the details with an ad network around why their performance sucks. Like it's you know it's like uh, scolding a dog <laughs> like when they when they misbehave. It's, it's like you might be angry, but I'm not going to hold it against them. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just what they do. Uh, I mean, not comparing ad networks to dogs. I'm just making the point. That, <laughs> you know, they they're just doing what they do. That's you know, rolling around in the mud and tracking in the house. This is what they do. Like, I'm not offended. I, I guess there's argument. I, I guess there's argument around maybe. I guess using that analogy, training and helping, yeah, well, coaching and yeah, providing guidance to yeah. a point. But if an ad network yeah. sucks, they don't get my money. Like I don't yeah, I don't yeah. care why. Money talks. What the reason yeah. is. Like it, you know, it's game over. So I mean, I, you know, I could you know, dig into the metrics and oh, well, actually, this on this particular publisher, you know, we were running in, in you know, an incent uh, placement. Okay, our relationship's over, but and that's great that now I know why exactly. the performance sucked. Yeah, no, no, no that's definitely a, definitely a different approach versus trying to kind of make that concerted effort of saying just. You know, it's not working. Let's move on and continually test and find new opportunities, right? And just proof is in the pudding. And if it's delivering, it's delivering. If it's not, it's not. Uh, versus going down deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, and maybe even not finding anything at the end of the day. Right? Yeah, but I mean, there's an inherent tension there. I mean, which which you know goes back to the you know the the lack of transparency around publisher IDs yep. is because. If they give you that information, they've sort of taken themselves out of that circuit, right? I mean, like, there's no need. 
if I can go direct to you know talking Tom Goldrush to get that uh, <laughs> amazing traffic, <laughs> like I don't need whatever ad network that's giving me access to that. So like th there's a, you know I understand why they don't do that. It makes total sense from their perspective, um, you know. But but at the same time, like I you know I tolerate that for as long as you know I'm making money. Yep. And if I'm not, then I don't care what the reasoning is around you know why I'm not. It doesn't matter. I mean you know. No, it makes perfect sense, for sure. Any uh, additional comments or perspectives on, on publisher level, Warren? I was just going to say, to, to bounce off what Eric is saying, it absolutely use this strategy when you're testing a new source, like no second chances, make that very clear up front. I think it's more about developing the methodology for like, your, okay, the sources you've already seen, this does work, how do we set the rules, and then put it, putting further the burden on your partners at the network themselves, like, hey, here's what we're holding you to. If you're hitting this, we keep building, we keep growing. But yeah, do be ruthless when it comes to vetting new sources, because there's too many out there. You'll waste your time on it. Awesome, awesome. Cool. So moving into, um, unless anyone else has additional comments, moving into the second uh, element around creatives in general, uh, we've actually asked each of the panelists to provide just some general case study or view of how they've used creative level granularity to make an optimization decision or just uh, a change to um, campaign delivery. So I actually don't know which one's going to come up first, but let's start with oh, hey, that's me. you, Patrick. Um, and we have some delicious... Yeah, so I think um, you know, with with our creative strategy, we have what we call we call like an evergreen campaign, something that we run uh, nationally, right? So you can get deep dish pretty much anywhere, but where is deep dish pre predominantly known? Chicago. So we'll run specific advertising campaign uh, calling out Chicago or a specific um, uh, deep dish place. I think. Um, the other, I think another one variation we had was like um, something Pizza East. I don't know whoever from Chicago can help me out there, but no idea. Um, anyways, typically what we see is you know things like pizza, things like Chipotle, typically do drive really good uh, results. But when you specifically call out city name or a type of food um, that people are delivering more uh, predominantly uh, in that specific area, the click-through rate, conversion rate, uh, first-time purchase rate is significantly higher. Uh, the problem is with that is you don't always necessarily get all of the scale. Um, especially if you're working with uh, uh, with advertising networks or advertising partners. Uh, the majority of our budget is, is spent on paid social, uh, where you're able to kind of rotate in specific creatives on Snapchat, you know, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, uh, a lot more frequently, do a lot more testing. Um, and that's really where we see a, a big bang for our buck in terms of our creative optimization process. So even in terms of the investment to create, uh, make creatives at that level, does pay off in terms of performance. 100%. Okay, cool. I mean, what, it, what what's it cost to hire one or two designers to change out ad text? It's not that okay. much. Exactly. <clears throat> Very cool. Next up, Andy. Oh, so this is a, yeah, I mean, I'll let you yeah. take it away. So Patrick talked more on the local differences here in the States. For us, Kabam, we're always looking for growth internationally as well. But I want to start here again in the U.S. and some ad formats and some inventories. You know, go piggybacking off of Victor's kind of uh, spiel before on the granularity of data, how it relates to creative is these creatives have come in many different sizes, shapes, and user experience. If you remember, say, three years ago, that's pretty far back to remember, three years ago, Facebook came out with the video. It's the 1920 by 1080. Then it was Game Changer when they had the square video and on Instagram. <laughs> and then Snapchat came along with the portrait video and then IG stories. And you get my gist here. There's a lot more ad inventory out there, a lot of different ways to engage your consumers. So I don't know if anyone's from Lemonade here. Sorry, I took your screenshot. I could not find an ad. You know, when you're trying to find an ad, you never get them, but you always get them when you're not looking for them. I don't know how that works, man. I like everything on Facebook. I know, right? <laughs> so here's a typical kind of flow for Facebook, IG, or Snap Store. You see the call to action on the bottom. Oh, the green box is wrong, but you see the landing page over there to, to engage with that ad. Uh, on the news feed, very typical. That's a video right there. YouTube, 1920 by 1080 video. And we also started running some campaigns out in Russia through Vkontakte, which is the Facebook of Russia. It's also a square inventory as well. But I want to segment this into the next slide as we look into some of the Chinese inventory where we've gotten really, uh, really interested in. So media is pretty much universal, but how people consume media across different geos is a little bit different. And these differences will start to converge over time. But I want to show you an example on the left. Douyin, or TikTok, is the number one video platform in China. It is basically an amalgamation of Snap, Facebook, uh, Instagram, just everything is so social about it. Here in this ad, 
um, people can comment on it, kind of like how people are able to comment on uh, Instagram or Facebook Live events. You can see the likes and the comments on the right as well. It's a very engaging ad, and that's how people out in, in China like to engage with their ads. We're kind of seeing this right now, but it still hasn't gone into an advertisement form, or no one's really cracked that yet. Next on the right, we have Tochiao, which is the number one news site in China. It's very similar to every other kind of news feed uh, user experience. The only thing here for this NetEase game, you click on that ad and a landing page comes up. So if you look at Facebook, when you click on it, you go in immediately into the App Store. Here in China, it's OK for people to tell a little bit more about their game, get them engaged with that content. You can slide through that actually three times before you're able to kind of install now. And over there on the right, QQ Zone, similar UI UX as Facebook, social networking. But there are similarities. But at the, at the, at the same time, there are also a little bit of differences. But with more of these ad formats coming, I think it's going to be very important to take, pay very close attention to vertical uh, and square and landscape over time. When moving into uh, <clears throat> emerging markets, like what, what KPIs are you looking at to understand quality uh, and know that it's actually working at the end of the day? Because it's all brand new, more or less. Yeah, sure. You always have organic data to lean off of, so mm -hmm. you know what kind of your base case or your expected performance should be. And then you start asking your questions like, OK, which channels will be a right fit here? Because using Facebook in China isn't going to work. Sometimes using some ad networks and some geos is just simply not going to work. So you have to ask yourself those questions to get to the next step in, uh, in optimizing that. But when you start running your campaigns, you will look at the LTVs on the, on the, on the organics and on the paids. And then we'll see the CPIs that, that that particular geo or that campaign is generating. So we get an idea of what that yield or the return on ad spend from that geo looks like. Compound that, extrapolate that to see what our one year expected return will be. If that looks good, we'll keep going. If not, we'll, we'll dial it back. Awesome, awesome. Very cool. I've never seen actually the, the whole comment thing. And you said that? Yeah, that ad got 37,000 likes and wow. 600 comments in two days. Very cool. All right, well. Okay, so Andy had actual relevant content. I just have something shiny here. <laughs> um, so this is for a game that we're launching next week, uh, actually this week, called Darkness Rises. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about premium, like it's premium uh, ad units. Yeah. Um, you should look at every impression as an opportunity, right? We, you're, you're paying for the right to show something. And initially, people were showing static ads, and now video is table stakes. Playables are nothing new. Like, you, this should be part of your workflow now. There's uh, about a year ago, you could just make any playable, and we would see things like we had one title we were buying for over two years. We made the first playable, and all of a sudden, the source that was running it had twice the install rate per 1,000 impressions of any video we'd made before, and all of a sudden, our campaigns were performing in a completely different class. So now we've added to like our title rollout, besides the standard video package that I'll ask for for a launch, um, we're making as many playables as possible to have them day one. Um, so this was one that was done by our friends at Iron Source, um, who've been doing a great job. They were early to the playable space. Uh, one thing we ran into with this game, Darkness Rises, it's uh, like console quality graphics on mobile is, is one of the things we're excited about with this title. But you can't get that to come across with the playable because the, um, the file is it's going to be too large. So uh, I don't know if we can play it again, but um, Iron Source took the approach of just actually using sort of more of an interactive video unit. Uh, it's showing off one of the key mechanics in the game where you take over your enemies and um, in this case you've defeated a dragon and you get to actually take over its soul and start writing it using against your enemies. It's really just playing a series of video clips, but it's uh, po poised, uh, posed as an interactive unit. So this is something we're pretty excited about that captured the, sort of the fidelity of video to show off um, a, a game with good curb appeal, but still gets the user interacting with it. Um, we took some very different approaches. We have one that's like a character creation approach for this game, a few that are battle-based, and then this one showing off the core mechanic. So be creative. Um, your, your, your internal creative team might be out of their comfort zone when you try to um, encourage them to go into playables, but there are third-party agencies that are starting to offer for these services as well. They can work in tandem with your creative team to storyboard, to get the assets together. But the competition is going to be doing this, so you should be starting to build this into your rollout as well. And if you're not games, think about other ways you can make interactive ad units, because the rest of us are, and that's going to cause your competitor's conversion rate to go up, and you just won't be in the game if you're not uh, making units of this type. And from a performance basis, you see that uh, the high quality, high engagement, type ad formats are, are really kind of translating in terms of ROI as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you want something that's going to stand out. People see ads all day, every day. Um, Patrick alluded to just like how uh, creating better ad copy, just how much that can move it. So when you just have a completely different experience that you're putting in front of your user, uh, it's going to be, I, I mean, it's going to be the highest variable. It's either going to be the biggest winner or just going to be total crap. But those are the things you want to you, you try. Like every team knows how to make kind of their bread and butter ads that showcase mm -hmm. the, the basic uh, features of the product, but, but get wild. Like the, the best video unit we had last year was just almost all fans talking about their experience with the game. It had almost no gameplay, and it was all audio based, which is just breaking every fundamental rule of what a UA video should be. But it was just one of those wilder ideas that just carried basically about a quarter of our buying while we just kept throwing all our standard things at it and like, nope, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. This wild idea kept carrying it. Wow, just broke through the clutter really well. It's cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. Love to hear uh, your perspective over at Yelp. Yes, so uh, uh, yeah, at Yelp, we really made a push into social this uh, past year or so. And uh, obviously, Facebook is the big social channel. But Pinterest, which is often overlooked, uh, is an interesting play on MAI. And uh, it really appeals to the uh, Yelp core audience, if you think about it, uh, where uh, Pinterest is kind of heavily female. And uh, and you know women with iPhones basically, so it can appeal to uh, the Yelp audience, right? So initially, when we ran the MAI uh, campaigns on Pinterest, we kind of worked through a generic flow where we uh, used uh, on the right kind of uh, messaging for reviews, so you can see reviews for anything you could need on Yelp. What we found with Pinterest that's pretty interesting is through targeting on search keywords, search intent, and so forth, and uh, also some demo uh, targeting, you can uh, basically get much better results. And uh, we actually leverage that in our creative. So uh, Ankur and Sarah on the performance team on my end kind of pushed uh, the limit with really sub, uh, with granular targeting on interest groups and actually use that in the creative concepts. So for example, nail salons, like you wouldn't think to target ads specifically for nail salons, but uh, guess what, like it works on Pinterest. CTR was 5X, the generic. Uh, c creative, and uh, obviously there's a scale issue. It doesn't scale as much, but uh, it actually performs well from both CTR perspective and also post-install uh, engagement. One other things that we found is uh, tattoos. I, we don't necessarily think of tattoo as, uh, as an interest group that is uh, fundamentally converting well in performance marketing, but uh, on Pinterest, people actually search for tattoos and kind of get inspiration from for uh, different tattoos they want to do, and showing them tattoos in the ad copy for Yelp with kind of punchy copy, like flex your ink and so forth. That's not like super hardcore, cheesy DR, but has a little bit of uh, you know think about the copy and so forth. Uh, actually converted well, like even 10x the generic, right? So. I think what this is saying, if you have the resources to take that extra level, you can be really granular not only in the targeting, but also in the creative itself and kind of take that creative all the way to a post-install event that's uh, unique to the targeted segment and that can have uh, really interesting uh, effects on your performance marketing. Now, I know Singular's worked with Yelp uh, as creative team uh, closely in terms of data and, and empower them with more insights. That, Love to for you to kind of share any commentary you have on how the creative team may have evolved over time, and you know any best practices or recommendations of you know marketing teams engaging and how they engage with their their. That's a great point. So we've uh, empowered the creative team with data by uh, well, first of all, providing them logins to Singular, but also through uh, monthly and even biweekly hour-long check-ins where we actually share the performance data of every creative concept and uh, benchmark it against uh, the creative that have been performing consistently, evergreen creative. And uh, what we really want to empower the creative team to think about how to make ads that turn uh, you know, pixels into dollars effectively, right? So, you know, the challenge has always been that uh, Yelp is kind of uh, comes from is a brand and has not done performance marketing, so there's always the uh, 
the impetus of is it brand safe? Is it within the spirit of the brand? Is it this brand, that brand? And you know, as DR people, like we're trying to measure every yeah. possible dollar, so the brand element is uh, a little challenging. But while by perform showing the actual data on a per creative and concept basis, that really helps the creative team understand kind of what they're striving towards. The other thing that we've done is brought uh, platform or advertising partners to teach the creative team about uh, other DR uh, strategies that work. So for example, Snapchat gave us a pretty good session where they walked us through the different uh, creative uh, things that have worked well on the platform. and. Uh, Snapchat's in the room, so ask them for that. <laughs> uh, but what I found really interesting was that it, if we get a benchmark for like what is this, the swipe up rate that we should shoot for for Snapchat or the click-through rate or on uh, a Facebook ad and so forth, then we kind of give that to the creative team. They have something to work with and something to shoot for. If they even put that in their OKRs for the quarter, that kind of makes everyone accountable. So on top of just giving access to data, having shared OKRs on, you know, we want the creatives that you churn out. Like every month we want a CTR or swipe up rate of X. And that's kind of what we're holding you accountable for. That kind of empowers and also keeps everyone focused on, on the, the goal, which is driving the most effective impressions. Right. Awesome. Yeah, I apologize I didn't uh, provide a creative. But I think um, our approach has been to, um, to build tools that allow us to be uh, radically experimental. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're 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 building um, about 50 videos a week uh, that we uh, deploy and then you know to test and then um, you know deploy more universally. The idea being that I mean we spend so much money and we're chasing a fairly niche audience that you know whatever we deploy is going to hit saturation very fairly quickly. So it's not I think you know taking the approach of putting a lot of thought, uh, you know, sort of a priori into the form that the creative takes is probably less effective for us, at least, than just building a ton of stuff uh, that's like, you know, wildly divergent from potentially stuff that's worked in the past to avoid being caught in like a local maximum um, and, you know, giving a shot to every possible you know, potential thing that we could showcase to get people to download the game. Um, so it's that leans heavily on the technology that we've built, and you know, not anybody could do that. But I think it's worked for us, um, and it's it's helped us keep uh, keep our creatives fresh and uh, and not you know degrade that performance uh, week over week. Awesome! That sounds really exciting. Um, so I guess in terms of creative and uh, building off kind of y'all's point and your guys' interaction with creative teams, building 50, like you mentioned, 50 a week, um, seems pretty pretty intense. Uh, Super guess, intense. Yeah. Uh, I guess what's the... I had my boss uh, <laughs> cut half of the seat off of my chair because I only need the edge. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I guess how do you... I guess how do you... <laughs> How do you guys balance uh, the relationship between the creative teams and kind of the needs from the, the DR side? Uh, I know in terms of collaboration, is it more of a one-way street of this is what we need? Um, yeah, how's it get done? Right? Because not everyone has the resources or so the same way. For us at Postmates, um, our CEO is very protective of our brand. I mean, we want to kind of distinguish ourselves with, uh, you know, between Uber Eats, DoorDash, et cetera. So um, what I did is I sat down with the brand team and basically asked for uh, guidelines to help pump out creative in terms of you know, what's going to be acceptable for the brand, uh, from the brand perspective. Um, so they uh, you know, provided us a color palette, um, types of angles and things that we would be able to use. So they're slightly limiting, but uh, something that I know that if you know, the CEO sees this ad, I'm not going to get yelled at, <laughs> uh, which is basically how I'm living my Good life. Not yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, so you know, when I have these you know guidelines to follow, I know that when I'm working with my creative team, um, which is uh, one person right now helping me create these you know boomerang uh, deep dish ads, um, you know we know that you know this is going to be acceptable from a brand perspective. And then we, I also do what you was mentioning. Uh, we go every two weeks. We sit down as a brand and performance marketing um, uh, creative uh, creative meeting to say this is the type of 
uh, these are the new ads that are working. This is what didn't work. This is the cost per new unique user. This is the return, et cetera. Um, the brand team doesn't really get it, but they at least understand its performance overall. So kind of just roll with it. Yep. Yeah. Job's done. Yeah. The, well, why did this, well, this one has a pink background and this one has a blue background. Why'd the pink one work better? I don't know. It just works better. Yeah. Like, let's just keep it going. <laughs> Perfect. Andy, what no. Yeah, I, th I think one of the main things is getting um, everyone, including the creative team them themselves, to understand their role in, in the actual performance and to not think of like creatives as a fixed expense. Like one of the worst questions I get all the time is like, could we save money on this launch by not making as many creatives or by making lower quality creatives? It's like, no, 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 this is just gonna dig us further into the hole. Like you, you don't wanna chase bad money, but like once you know you have a good product, uh, be looking at like the ROAS on the creatives themselves. You know, like uh, it's a balance of doing like this massive iteration that, that Eric's alluding to, and then taking like those big those big shots, like those really like showcase pieces that maybe that's your new like really meaty thing that you can then you know iterate and pull bits and pieces from um, for a bunch of variants there on out. But teach your creative team how to read the the data in Singular or any other creative measurement platform and uh, champion them. Like when they have made a uh, creative that like let you guys leverage and do you know a couple million more and spend profitably than you did. Like help them like. They're not going to be, by definition, as data savvy as some of the other departments. So help them learn how to talk about that and showcase their wins and make their own case to do these other bigger initiatives that, that get the ROAS. Don't think of it as a fixed cost and never try to cut corners by not doing enough creative. Awesome. Right over at Kapam. Yeah, so I'll speak to kind of a branded game IP perspective. Um, with, the, with a title like Marvel, there are you know very explicit mm -hmm. conditions. Uh, some of them might sound really silly, like, you know, Spider-Man can't stand next to Wolverine, but they're very <laughs> adamant about that. So you, you, we learn these things over time, obviously. So, you know, the brand integrity is obviously one thing, but we've been running a game for almost four years now. So we've learned what works with our videos. And so we're always optimizing or iterating off of things that work. One example is we had two videos, one with the UI, one without the UI. Um, our game is a fighting game. So without the UI, it kind of looks too CGI, it looks too good to be true. You don't know if they're really fighting, if that's actually happening. And when we added the UI to show that, hey, these people are hitting each other, this is cool. It's like Street Fighter. So you know, we iterate off of those concepts. After we took that, we said, OK, well, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, everyone says 30 seconds is the standard three years ago. Um, but it takes a lot of effort to make a video going into 30 seconds. Um, over the time and some research, you know, talking to some ad partners along the way, we found that 20, 22, 23 seconds still got the job done. Cutting their time by seven seconds on making a video is huge. Um, and so we found lots of returns from iterating and learning, learning about these things along the way. Awesome. Cool. Um, so you know, we tackled two key components of optimizing around uh, granularity. And I, I kind of want to shift the conversation to more of a future gazing um, aspect and really understand what you guys think the next levels of granularity will be and how that's going to really impact your businesses. Um, so. In the context of having user level ROI tomorrow, uh, I, I guess the question to the panel is, how would you guys harness that information um, in a general sense to, to drive your businesses? Sure, I can talk more. <laughs> I can always talk more. Uh, for, for me, there's a specific pain point that we're trying to get better at. I, I think the industry is still very young um, and, and immature when it comes to like truly measuring retargeting performance the, the right way. The models are complicated. They're a pain in the ass to, to develop. And then even when you have the theoretical of like, okay, here's how we can uh, best measure like true incrementality, um, the implementation of that is, is painful as well. Um, so uh, getting user level cost um, is very important. Uh, it, Retargeting is very different from new user acquisition. New user acquisition, you have a fixed cost. You paid once to get the user in, and then you get revenue from that in perpetuity as long as they're in the in the game. But retargeting, uh, most best practices, you continue to keep showing ads to the same user. And you have to track, okay, what's this delta of increasing cost to the user versus um, increasing uh, revenue, and then looking at a control and making sure that your increased cost never outpaces the incrementality gain. So it's, 
it's not a pretty model, um, but that's, it's one thing that doesn't work until you have um, user level cost. And that's something that we're trying to crack right now and hopefully you know, with features such as that can solve. Yeah, and to add to that point, uh, fractional attribution is something that uh, is not yet cracked even by user level cost. And I think that's uh, something that uh, we as sophisticated marketers are really pushing towards. For example, if you see a video ad on Facebook and then uh, the last click is claimed by a DSP, should you attribute any of that cost to Facebook since uh, well, you already paid for it in terms of the impression? And also, uh, that may have driven to the last click, and the last click could have been uh, misattributed, uh, right? Uh, but not based on the true intent. So, fractional attribution is uh, kind of one of the future things, and uh, that that does tie into platforms sharing user journey level data more openly, and uh, that's not something that Singular or other attribution partners can make happen, but that's more of kind of a Facebook, Google uh, uh, policy. But I think, you know, if we as marketers in the room push towards user journey level data, uh, I think that'll help us understand where to really place our dollars more effectively, and that'll answer a lot of the incrementality questions. I guess, Eric, to you, I mean, having that depth of information uh, in kind of your executions today around programmatic buying strategies, um, what, what, I guess, what's on the wish list? What's the incremental benefit of getting that level of depth in, in terms of influencing how you buy, or how teams buy? Um, I mean, I would say for the most part, we already have that. I, I don't feel like we're missing that, but I don't think it's super valuable. I don't, I, th I mean, I, I feel like if you could track user journeys across Facebook-owned properties, that would be valuable, but Facebook's never, ever going to give you that. Um, I mean, beyond that, I don't know what you would do with that information. I mean, if I could like fractionally attribute installs, then I think I would just end up paying more uh, for installs because everybody would want to claim it. Um, but from the programmatic side, I mean, I know how much I pay at the impression level, uh, you know, via CPM. So I don't, I don't really feel like I'm missing any data there. Uh, I think what where I see people developing um, kind of domain expertise is actually deploying money programmatically, which is uh, you know fundamentally the same as just you know writing a check to whatever ad network, but mm -hmm. it's it requires a lot of um, infrastructure and uh, just a totally different set of knowledge. Um, so that feels like the way a lot of bigger advertisers are developing their marketing teams. Well, just as an example of why good user journey uh, data can be helpful, if uh, Facebook is targeting all users who just bought an iPhone yesterday or this past week, and, uh, and you're a big brand that people download anyway, such as Uber, Postmates, Yelp, whatever, uh, if you don't know uh, how many uh, unique impressions were served to that user in the user journey, uh, Facebook can claim credit for that user, uh, and they, the, that user would have come back and would have downloaded the app anyway. So that's kind of an incrementality uh, concern that uh, sh that if you have true user journey, you can avoid. And the same goes with if I see that every D that this particular DSP uh, is claiming users that were in the user journey of at least three other. Uh, networks, and maybe I don't want to work with this DSP because they're really good at attribution, but they're not necessarily driving the install. So it's just on uh, why a user journey works, uh, why is more important for specific use cases. Got it. Any last comments on that? Uh, I want to make sure we spare the last few minutes for audiences to the uh, question from the audiences. Mentality, granularity. Questions from the audience? No, we went pretty deep there. Don't be shy. All right, with that, uh, I'd just like to wrap it up and thank you guys so much for participating in the panel. Uh, hopefully the audience was able to gain some insights in kind of what's being done today, as well as some of the challenges that uh, face the industry moving forward. Thank you.